All right, everyone, we're going to move on to the next set of speakers. This is a lovely pair of speakers that we have coming on. First is Louise Chernin. Louise Chernin is the president and CEO of GSBA, Washington State's LGBTQ and Allied Chambers of Commerce. GSBA is one of the oldest and largest LGBTQ chambers in North America with over 1,400 members. In addition to business development and advocacy on behalf of business and civil rights, GSBA sponsors a scholarship fund, which since 1990 has awarded over 4 million to 500 LGBTQ and allied students in Washington state. GSBA is also the sponsor of Travel Out Seattle, an LGBT tourism initiative created to increase revenue in the state of Washington. After nearly 50 years of activism within the women's movement, peace movement, civil rights movement, and LGBTQ movement, Louise continues to fight to live her life committed to advanced equality, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Fighting the good fight is her mantra, and activism is part of her DNA, and we are so thrilled to have her on this forum for you. Joining her is Tiffany Wilk Chang, board member and secretary for the National Organization of Women, Seattle. Tiffany joined the Seattle Now Board in spring of 2018, shortly after moving to Seattle from her hometown of Denver. She's now a political and public affairs consultant who works with clients throughout Washington State. Whether she's working with political candidates, academic centers, students, or global coalitions, Tiffany loves to work with clients who develop their unique voice. She's active in competitive debate community, and her primary debate passion has been assisting in building up high school debate circuits in West Bank, Palestine. She has recently invested her time in the women's tournaments and mentorship opportunities in the debate community and originally from a rural suburbia outside of Denver, she's a proud first generation graduate of the University of Denver, where she received BA degrees in international studies and political science with concentrations in the Middle East and women's studies. She now lives in Shoreline with her partner Chris, her dog Cammie, and her cat Winchester. So let's get these two lovely women on and let's move on to the next part of this panel. Great. Thank you, Hillary. I will start. I'm, uh, as Hillary mentioned, uh, Louise Chernin. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I'm delighted to be on this uh, with this discussion with Tiffany, who we met over this, and I think we really enjoyed chatting with each other. I want to thank Linda Tosti Lane for connecting us and for all the years that she's worked for women's rights. Um, so as as, uh, as Hillary said, I've been uh, working with GSBA for a number of years, but prior to that, uh, in, the nine, uh, in the 80s, actually, I worked with Seattle Now. I was uh, the director there from 83 to 87, and then I was a board chair for a few years with, uh, with Thalia Sirikopoulos. Uh, we used to say we were Thelma and Louise. Um, and... Uh, so it's, I, I do want to acknowledge, first of all, that it is Pride Weekend, and uh, it's an, a different kind of Pride Weekend this year than uh, they have been for a number of years. It's not all rainbows. Uh, it's a serious time, and I think it is a time that uh, us, uh, those of us in the LGBTQ movement are really trying to reflect on our own history and uh, the really jump-starting of the LGBTQ civil rights movement from a riot at Stonewall in New York, uh, although there was even one before that in California at Comstock, and that um, we know that we had to take to the streets, and the people who actually we owe uh, the start of the gay liberation movement to really were uh, African American and women of color, uh, mostly the trans women of color. So uh, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera and others. And the, it, is, it is known but not talked about enough that the entire LGBTQ movement for uh, equality and recognition of our humanity is based in the civil rights movement. And I think it was never more apparent than seeing the, the Supreme Court decisions win last week on recognizing that uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act do, does include sexual orientation and gender identity. And that is because of the civil rights movement. So it is very important that we see all equality movements are really connected. You cannot have one without the other. Um, and as we know, we have our black and brown uh, siblings are in the streets now, and we all need to be. And hopefully, I want to be hopeful, even though it's a dark time between healthcare and an economic collapse, that people are in the streets because we are going to try to really dismantle the 
the incredible embedded racism in every institution that we have. And so uh, today, interesting that we're going to um, start our conversation about the Equal Rights Amendment. A hundred years, still not passed. Perhaps it's very complicated, so let me read it to you. It is equality of rights under the law, shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Yeah, that's it. That's it. 24 words or whatever it is, but somehow it's been too hard to figure out how to get those 24 words into the constitu Constitution. So it started, uh, and Tiffany will go more into the history, but what today we want to set the stage for is, should this be passed? Will it make a difference? Is it still relevant? Is it inclusive? Was it created to include all women, including women of color, our black and brown sisters, and what about our trans women? Um, is it really for everybody? Will it change the world? We have a lot of thinking to do because it takes a lot of energy to pass things. Is our energy being appropriately targeting something that will really make a difference? So now I turn things over to Tiffany. Great, uh, next slide. Good morning, all. I'm so happy to be with you and have a chance to be in conversation with Luis. It's been such a great process, kind of interacting with one another and having these really important and critical conversations around the Equal Rights Amendment. So we're kind of just sharing our internal conversations with you. Um, so, but where we have to start first is why are we talking about the Equal Rights Amendment today? Um, the obvious answer, we do not have constitutional protected equality for all sexes. I don't know how. I do know how, but I, it's outrageous. Um, so that's one reason. Second, um, in the last five years, we've seen a major revitalization of momentum to finish out the job of of enacting passing the ERA. Um, and so we can't talk about how we got here to where we are today without acknowledging where we came from. Um, so that's where we'll start. Uh, interestingly, the fight for the Equal Rights Amendment has kind of revived and died with each wave of the feminist movement, never fully getting ratified and implemented. So the first wave, the first introduction came on the heels of uh, the women's suffrage movement in the very early 1900s, and it was introduced initially by suffragettes, Alice Paul, Crystal Eastman, among many others, just wanna name that lineage of our founding mothers. Um, and the underlying reason is to constitutionally codify and judicially protect equality on the basis of sex. Um, so interestingly, in 1923, it was introduced to Congress by Susan B. Anthony's nephew, uh, where it was introduced but never actually got momentum and it got reintroduced every year after that uh, until 1970, never really picking up steam. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this slide is just an overview of the very circuitous path through Congress and ratification at the state level, mostly for y'all to look at uh, later if you're interested, it's a little wordy, um, but just some of the highlights of the process and the history of that that I think is important for our conversation. Um, introduced in 1923, in 1970, the first major steps were accomplished. Feminist leaders like Shirley Chisholm ran for Congress on the platform of passing the Equal Rights Amendment and were successful. So in 1972, Congress approved the language out of both houses and sent it to the states to ratify. Um, 38 states are needed to ratify the amendment for it to be enacted. And by 1974, we had 30 states signed on. So it had incredible momentum at that time, but the opposition movement was pretty well organized, pretty loud, and pretty successful at shutting down that progress in the 70s. Um, the important procedural point that's critical for understanding the process and the history of the ERA is that Congress, when they sent it to the states to ratify, um, they included a deadline for ratification. Initially, it was 1979 that all states would have needed to ratify by, and then they extended that deadline to 1982. Um, up to that point, we had reached 35 states ratifying, and then it sat from 1982 to 20. 17, 2016, not really getting much further momentum. Um, so the high level message here is it's been a century long fight to get this 
constitutional protection. Um, but what we're more interested in is the movement was obviously much more complicated than simple momentum and opposition on the ground. And that's why it's so exciting to do this talk with Luis. So I want to pass it back over to look at what did it really look like on the ground in the 1970s and 80s. So we can go to the next slide, please. Yeah. Um, thanks, Tiffany. Well, it was interesting. I started uh, working, you know, before I work with, with now, I was much more involved in the uh, anti, uh, well, early on first, the uh, anti-Vietnam War movement, uh, the civil rights movement, and, um, and, the, and then the women's rights movement. But when I was I moved to Seattle in, in 1976, I mean, Shirley Chisholm was somebody I really admired. She, later on, Bella Abzug, and Shirley did run for president of the United States. So I, do, I just want people to recognize that. We actually had, uh, I believe it was a state convention for her. And then later on for Sonia Johnson, uh, another woman who ran for president of the United States who was Mormon and who was, the Mormon church was one of the big fighters of, about the Equal Rights Amendment. And we built a Mormon church in Bellevue and uh, Sonia Johnson came here. She changed herself with other women. They, to prevent the opening of the Mormon church at that time. It was important to know it was the insurance industry, it was the Mormon church, uh, it was these um, anti-feminist organizations led by Phyllis Schlafly, and I know there's a movie now, This is America, that people can, can watch about Phyllis Schlafly, um, but it was, uh, it, it, people, women were giving their time day and night to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, and I came on when it was really looking for the last couple of states to ratify, and people were going into the South, and they were, uh, Seattle now was one of the largest chapters of the country at that time, um, it was a very active chapter, it was a very lesbian-run chapter uh, of the um, of NOW, it was more radical than some of the other chapters, I like to believe it is still, uh, it's meeting Tiffany, I believe that it is uh, still a good radical organization. And, uh, you know, in the end, it failed, but it was literally taking over everybody's lives. At the same time, we were dealing with violence against women as an issue, uh, domestic violence, uh, because p uh, glass ceiling, looking at the pay disparity, uh, it is pretty amazing that none of these things have moved all that far. I mean, we have laws now against rape and marital rape and domestic violence. They're, they're named and there are laws, but the incidents of them, the uh, incredible racism and um, classism and how these laws are applied is, uh, is not all that different, even though it is uh, 50 years later, um, or some of them. So uh, all of that is so very shocking. I, I think for me, what I want us today to say is, okay, we were doing this. How did we have a constitution, I think Tiffany raised that, that left out more than half the population and all people of color? And I, uh, I've been really thinking about this during the last couple of weeks, three weeks, is why is this constitution so revered? Why is everybody think it's the end all and be all and everything should be judged by it when it was created by white men to protect white property men? It never was meant to include women or people of color. It never was meant to equalize things and provide opportunity. It was meant to protect a certain class of people and a certain race of people. And we've spent all these years since it was created chipping away at it and adding amendments. Um, adding amendments so that women could vote, so that, um, so that black people could vote, so that people of color could be recognized, so that reproductive rights could be recognized. And as we see, it's not necessarily working because we then have to fight it and the laws are changed and we go back to the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court gets conservative like it is now, um, we can lose those even at the Supreme Court level. So why is all focus on this most hallowed document when it really wasn't meant for us to begin with? So people don't like to think about that because again, it is so ingrained, but as we're facing trying to understand how a system has been so racist from its beginning, from our taking this land over, from our founding, what we say founding fathers, and we like to always add, and mothers, of course they were there, but they weren't included in any of the decision-making. They probably just did a lot of the work. But um, 
I want us to think about that. Where is our energy going? Is it in the right place? Um, and even with now, I know there's some national controversy about now that they are, they're our pres the president there is being accused of, of racism. Um, but, but even way before, way before this president, we know that it's been a predominantly white movement. And although I believe racism has been talked about, um, it's more been little, little parts of it here and there, we have not tried to dismantle a system that has been so oppressive. And the women's movement has really, really, uh, and that continues, um, not taken into account supporting our sex, the women in the sex work industry. Um, we want to believe that you would not make that choice, but what it is is a total un lack of understanding of what, what crimes of, of survival are all about why there is prostitution, why people are in the sex industry. And instead of supporting our, our sisters and women identified other women to ensure that everybody has opportunities and can be treated fairly, we have divided that. So today we're, we hope we unpack that. We hope we see nothing hallowed. There is nothing that we should be supporting if it is supporting a system that has not included everybody. So I really hope you're writing good questions, you're thinking about what we need to do to be brave, have courageous conversations, uncomfortable conversations, to truly try to start changing things at the root. What do you think, Tiffany? You're, you're the millennial, I'm the old timer. Um, can we take a look at our next slide, please? Um, I think what's been so amazing about the process of Luis and I preparing for this conversation is exactly asking those questions of each other. And we don't have hard and fast answers. We do know that we can't be doing the same old, same old. We can't be lifting up the same white, predominantly white led organizations. We have to be leading and amplifying and uplifting our BIPOC community leaders and LGBTQ plus community leaders right now. So I think that's something we've been talking about a lot. Um, I am a super courts and procedural nerd. I'm a bureaucrat at heart. So digging deep into the process of the, um, the ERA was really fascinating for me. And thinking about, so I kind of want to apply that to what we're the 21st century revival, why we're talking about it today and why it has renewed relevancy. Um, and that's kind of a long answer to your question, Louise. We'll, I'll circle back. Um, so in the last five or so years, I think that we as a country and as progressives have seen an increased emphasis on procedure uh, like I don't remember for the left and for progressives before. And what I mean by that is I think pre-2016, we really took our democratic institutions for granted. Uh, I worked on Title IX policy as an undergraduate student and a recent graduate pre-Betsy DeVos. And wow, I had no idea how bad it could get. Um, I definitely took those institutions and norms for granted but it's just being shoved in our face the way that our institution was not built by or for us and was not made to serve us and can be torn down so quickly. Um, and the best example in my mind of that, of us as progressives and folks on the left and folks working on equality and equity is the Kavanaugh hearings because I think about um, the Me Too movement was a largely social and digital led movement that was so important for shining a light on what we all know to be our lived experiences. But the focus on the Supreme Court is something that Mitch McConnell has been focusing on for decades. And that's the reason that we have a vast majority of new judges being appointed, being conservative leaning or literalists or textualists, right? And with the Kavanaugh hearings, it was shoved right in our face how much process matters and institutions and norms matter. Um, so I kind of credit that a little bit with this revival, along with just the tireless efforts of folks um, working on ratification in Nevada, Illinois, and Virginia, the last three states that actually did ratify since 2016. Um, but in those intervening years, uh, between 1982, when the congressional deadline expired for state ratification, and like 2015, 2016, as Louise mentioned, the movement kind of went back to piecemeal change. 
progress, not perfection, right? As uh, social advocates are constantly arguing between progress or perfection, progress or purity, piecemeal or purity. Um, so piecemeal, we have about 35 states that have some sort of sexual or gender equality written into their state constitutions. We have amazing advocates like RBG taking a piecemeal approach to the court system and the legal system. Um, actually, my favorite factoid about her is that the first case that she actually used to establish sex equality was a men's rights case. <laughs> um, the only way to get sitting judges to listen to sex equality is to make it about men. <laughs> um, and other piecemeal stuff that, that's really important these days, Title IX and Title VII specifically. Um, so where are we now? The remaining three states needed have ratified. There's 38 states that have ratified, but there's still plenty of court battles to be fought, right? It's not been enacted. There's a legal question around whether or not the three states that have ratified outside the deadline are still, are, are valid. Um, and there's also been states in intervening years that have withdrawn their ratification. I think five states, including Idaho. So what does that mean for the ERA? It means a heck of a lot more work to be done from us. And that's why I think Louise raises the most important questions is, what would it do today? Um, it only includes the word sex, and there's some important critical uh, court precedent that we would need, that would need to be set around does sex apply to gender expression, identity, sexual orientation, and all of that, and is it worth the political capital that it would take to enact it amidst everything else that's going on? Louise has already opened that up that discussion for us, but it's really what we are, um, what we're grappling with between the two of us <laughs> and writ large as a movement, I think. So um, kind of open-ended, I do. I hope that we can move on to take some questions. Um, next slide, please. I have one more. Yep, those are the questions. If the ERA were enacted today, who would it protect? Is, you know, is it lifting up those who are furthest from justice? And if not, is it worth it? No, probably. <laughs> um, and what do we need next to tackle this fight for all, for equity for all? Um, I think we have one more slide of resources, but really I, I think we're ready to open up for conversation. Louise, what do you think? I, th I think we are. Um, I think it's interesting. I mean, if we have the Constitution, of course we want to say, how can you leave out 52% of the population? And if we had had the ERA, maybe back in the early days after the vote, or even in 1970, or even by 1982, perhaps we wouldn't have had some of the other battles we've had over the years of how to be included. And you know, when we started here, we were asked, I think, not necessarily to defend the ERA in our presentation, but to talk about its importance. And I think the more we talked, we said, I mean, the world has changed. Is this where we put our energy? And will it, even if we did and it's passed, what will it do for women and women, specifically women of color, and for identified women who were not at, who were at birth perhaps had a different gender assigned to them? What will it do or will it open up new battles? So we, we want to hear, uh, we hope you will submit a question and say, what will it be if we don't pass it? What will be the next battle? How do we have an inclusive um, movement for justice for all? Is it a women's rights movement? It, is it a, you know, I remember when people used to say, we're not just about women's rights or about human rights. That was in the 70s. And for women, we'd say, no, it's about women's rights. We're not even included yet as a human. So we have to start there. But now the movement has changed because there were so many years we didn't recognize so much even within the women's movement. So, um, so that's the discussion we want to have. We don't think it'll be over today. And we hope that you will use this time to challenge your own thoughts and have conversations with other people that are more connected to what's going on in your communities today as we look at every single institution from education healthcare, the justice system, the police department, to say, how do we ensure equality for all? Is it through a, an amendment to the Constitution or for a totally different movement? Yeah. So let's have some questions. Oh, I have one more thing to posit, actually, if that's okay, Hillary. Sure. <laughs> uh, the sure. last thing that I want to posit is, I think 
if I were to have to pick kind of where I land after Louise and I have been mulling this over for so long is I think the thing that stands out the strongest to me from the Equal Rights Amendment is that it resets the default for the Constitution. Currently, the Constitution does not require our Congress or any of our institutions to proactively require um, equity amongst sexes, right? And so the legal, and the most important piece of that is the legal precedent has then been on complainants to prove bias, and in many cases to prove that that bias was intentional. And those types of legal precedents, I think, are the most important impact in my mind of what the Equal Rights Amendment would do is resetting that default and resetting the inherent obligation of our government. Um, but my major qualm, I think, with the existing language of the ERA is on the basis of sex. It was limiting. It feels like a conservative Supreme Court could reinterpret the definition of what sex means. Who, you know, there's there's a lot of that's where I land on the on my most critical piece, I think. Thanks. Great. So we have a few questions that I've merged into kind of a larger discussion that I think uh, dovetails nicely into what we're doing with here. Um, there was a recent SCOTUS decision to interpret sexuality, orientation, and identity on the basis of sex um, as uh, viable for employment of sex discrimination um, with your employers. Um, no statements yet have been made on public accommodations or housing, but we have seen a similar ruling uh, on behalf of marriage equality. So the question is, how will certification of the ERA fast forward this process, or is it going to slow it down because of what you mentioned? It's, it's more ambiguously interpreted uh, notion of, of what sex is, and our ongoing discussion of how do we be inclusive while at the same time leaving room for that interpretation that's so important for people who are at risk. Yeah. Louise? You want me to take a crack at that? It's a complex question. Um, you know what? It was a great decision uh, last week in terms of, of, of um, the Civil Rights Act and including sexual orientation and gender identity. As you said, it is only in employment. There is an Equality Act that is before Congress uh, for the LGBTQ community um, that would be really about you know, housing and credit and uh, employment and, and all the various things. And certainly uh, people are working on that, which is a much broader uh, piece of legislation. And that's also been introduced now for, for a number of years. Um, I do think the, the decision opens up the possibility that, um, that some of the um, discriminatory other pieces of legislation could, would fall if it's interpreted. But I think it is very important because to understand that when, when the Equal, Equal Rights Amendment was created, we were really not including our trans community. They, have, they were not a part of that. And we do know that is a huge conflict in the women's movement. It was the downfall of the Michigan Women's Festival for those of us who remember, I mean, that festival ended a few years back. But, but trans women were not permitted to walk onto the grounds of the Michigan Women's Festival. So the ERA really, it went, originally it was not including lesbian women at all, or as Betty Friedan called the lesbian menace, it certainly didn't include trans women. And I think it's a very, um, because women and women identified women have so many barriers, so many barriers to equality, it's hard not to want to talk about women's equality. And I think we can't give it up. We know in terms of reproductive rights, uh, it is very, very important. But reproductive rights affect the trans community as well. And we have to recognize that. And healthcare, and having inclusive healthcare. And we're, I think as a women's movement, including myself, we're so afraid of not fighting for women's equality because we know we don't, we're not there yet, but yet we also recognize we built into it ways that we were not including all women when we started. So are we courageous enough to say we need to open it up and fight for all? And, uh, you know, I don't know if that's answering the question, Hillary, but I think we're, we're scared. Women know we have higher rates of violence. Our health care isn't, we don't have access to. Reproductive rights is threatened. And so we want to hold on to it, but in our holding on to it, is it only a few parts of the 
women's movement holding on to it? Or are we willing to open it up and say it's more than discrimination based on who is a woman and who isn't? Is it really have to open up totally? I, I don't really have the answers, but I do know that we can't be afraid because we think either Donald Trump He's going to say, see, even women aren't for equality, which of course is not true. We are for equality for everyone. And we do mean specifically women and women identified women who have been left out. But we want to challenge our own movement and not be afraid to be just like we didn't want to have red baiting and gay baiting. I don't want to be Trump baited either. I, I don't want to be silent because I'm afraid if we show some division, that's how we've kept other people out of movements. We're afraid. If we include trans people, then we won't get what we need here. We'll include you next time. No, we have to start including everybody from the start at the beginning. And um, I, want, I want to quote, what is it? Nothing about us without us uh, that Alicia brought up in her statement. I think we have to use that as a mantra because otherwise we're going to continue to make the same mistakes again and again. I think in that spirit, if we have one second to do our next slide before we wrap up, I know we're time crunching. Oh, no, not that slide. Oh, no, just kidding. Um, I used a previous version of the slideshow, my mistake, too. What we want to do at the very end of this, Luis and I, recognizing that the National Organization for Women is a predominantly white, historically predominantly white organization, recognizing the times that we're in. We want to lift up lead and amplify other BIPOC leaders that are actually really working on equity and justice in this time. So had wanted to lift up uh, Gender Justice League, El Centro de la Raza, uh, the King County Black Lives Matter movement, and there's one more that are all furthering equity in, in a really truly intersectional way. Um, so I'm sorry those logos didn't make it on the slide, but also, as I mentioned, I'm a procedure nerd. So here's some hyperlinks for you if you wanna do more reading. And of course, Legal Voice. So I want to make sure because they they have been at the forefront of dismantling things for a very long time. So I'm thrilled that they're today's beneficiary. I hope mm -hmm. people will be very generous in their support. Thank you guys so much. Uh, so we'll have a few more questions after everything else because you guys were throwing in some really good ones. But I really appreciate and I just nerded out absolutely over this entire historical discussion.